Next on Book TV, Steven Pinker argues we're living in the most peaceable era in human existence, and that through the spread of government, literacy, trade, and cosmopolitanism, humans have been able to increasingly control the inner demons that lead us to violence. This is about an hour and 15 minutes. Believe it or not, and I know most people do not, violence has been in decline for long stretches of time, and we today are probably living in the most peaceful time in our species' existence. The decline of violence has not been steady, it has not brought violence down to zero, and it is not guaranteed to continue. Nonetheless, it's a persistent historical development, visible on scales from millennia to years, from wars and genocides to the spanking of children and the treatment of animals. Uh, this evening, I'm going to discuss six major historical declines of violence, their immediate causes in terms of particular historical events of the era that a historian would uh, single out, but also their ultimate causes in terms of general historical forces interacting with human nature. The first major decline I call the pacification process. Until about 5,000 years ago, humans everywhere lived in anarchy without central government. What was like, life like in this state of nature? This is a question uh, on uh, which people have had opinions for many centuries. Thomas Hobbes in 1651 famously said that in a state of nature the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, a hundred years later, Jean-Jacques Rousseau countered that in a state of nature nothing can be more gentle than man in his primitive state. Well, both of these men were pontificating from the armchair. Neither of them knew anything about what life was like in a state of nature. And today we can do better. There are two me methods to measure death rates in non-state societies. One of them is forensic archaeology, a kind of CSI paleolithic. Namely, what proportion of prehistoric skeletons have signs of violent trauma, such as bashed-in skulls, decapitated skeletons, arrowheads embedded in femurs, parry fr fractures on ulnar bones, the kind of fracture you get when you hold up your arm to ward off a blow, and mummies found with ropes tied around their necks? <laughs> well, if... Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, I, uh, the, the space won't accommodate visuals, but I have a graph of uh, 20 prehistoric archaeological sites at which archaeologists have tried to estimate the proportion of skeletons with uh, signs of violent trauma. They range from 0% to 60%, and the average is uh, about 15%. Uh, let's compare the, that 15% figure with those of some state societies. For example, the uh, United States and Europe through the 20th century, the comparable rate of uh, death from warfare was about 1%. If we uh, try to get the worst possible figure by throwing in all the war deaths, all the deaths from genocides, and all the deaths from man-made famines throughout the world during the 20th century, the figure is about 3%. The figure for the world in 2005, uh, for the most recent decade, on the graph is invisible because it's far less than a pixel. It's about uh, three tenths of uh, one, uh, three tenths of one percent. The second way of estimating the rate of violent death in non-state societies is by examining ethnographic vital statistics. That is, what percentage of people living in uh, extant or recent non-state societies, hunter-gatherer and hu hunter-horticultural and other tribal societies, die at the hands of uh, their, their fellow uh, humans. Uh, again, the graph that I would display if I was displaying graphs shows 27 societies for which such figures are available. They range, and here I've plotted them using the conventional criminologist scale of uh, violent deaths per 100,000 people per year. The deaths ra rates range from 0 to 1,500, but the average is about 500 uh, deaths per 100,000 people per year. That is one half of 1%. Again, let's compare that figure, a bit more than 500, with the 
corresponding figure for some states. And again, we'll stack the deck against states by choosing the most violent states in the most violent eras in their history, such as Germany in the 20th century. Two world wars, the figure is about 150. That's a similar figure uh, to what we have for Russia in the 20th century, which had went through two world wars, a revolution, and a civil war. Japan in the 20th century was closer to 60. The United States in the 20th century was less than three. And the world in the 20th century uh, is about a, uh, a third of a death per 100,000 per year. Uh, sorry, that's the world in the first decade of the 21st century. The world in the 20th century, throwing in all of the world wars, genocides, and man-made famines is about 60 per 100,000 per year, far less than the 524 per 100,000 per year that we find in non-state peoples. Well, what was the immediate cause of this uh, change in rate of violent death? The most likely one is the rise and expansion of states. Students of history are familiar with the various paxes, that is, pieces imposed by an empire or hegemon, the Pax Romana, Pax Islamica, Pax Britannica, Pax uh, Sinica, and so on. Uh, when a state imposes control over a territory, it tends to try to stamp out tribal raiding and feuding. It's not because uh, that this comes from a uh, benevolent interest in the welfare of the subject peoples, but rather all of this raiding and feuding is a nuisance to the overlords <laughs> because it just settles scores among them and shuffles resources around at a net loss to the overlords who would just as soon keep the uh, people alive to provide them with taxes and tributes and slaves and, and uh, serfs. Just as a farmer has an interest in preventing his cattle from killing each other, because it's just a dead loss to him, so an uh, emperor or uh, warlord will try to keep his, his uh, subject peoples from uh, killing each other at a loss to himself. The second historical transition in violence has been called the civilizing process, and it refers to the transition between life in the Middle Ages, and I have a, a lovely woodcut here of knights cudgeling, stabbing, and uh, uh, th put, putting daggers through peasants, uh, and the early modern period. It turns out that in many parts of Europe, homicide statistics go back uh, hundreds of years to the 14th and often the 13th century. And if you plot homicide statistics over time, over the centuries, you find that they plummet from an average rate of about 35 per 100,000 per year to the contemporary European rate of 1 per 100,000 per year, a decline by a, about a factor of 35. Uh, this is one of many graphs that I'm going to ask you to imagine, which consists of a uh, jagged line that meanders from the top left of the graph when statistics uh, first started to be kept for the category of violence I'll, I'll be discussing, and meanders its way down to the bottom right of the graph, which represents the era in which we are now living. And that is true for homicide uh, in Europe. Uh, the immediate cause of the uh, European homicide decline was identified by the German sociologist in his, Norbert Elias in his book called The Civilizing Process, namely that during the transition from the Middle Ages to modernity, there was a consolidation of central states and kingdoms out of the European patchwork of baronies and principalities and duchies and uh, fiefs. As a result, criminal justice was nationalized, and a life of feuding warlords we, they, they were uh, called knights, but today we would call them warlords, was replaced by the king's justice, where some genius had the idea that if instead of the family of a victim connect, collecting blood money from the fa family of a killer, if it was the state that con collected that money, it would be a constant revenue stream. Uh, and in fact, the uh, king sent a representative to every town uh, once a year to tally the number of homicides so that the king could collect compensation from the uh, family of the perpetrator. This agent of the crown uh, was called the coroner, uh, which is why we still call the official who assesses causes of deaths the coroner.
Aside from the co consolidation of states, the transition from Middle Ages to modernity saw a growing infrastructure of commerce. Institutions such as money and finance and contracts that could be enforced and recognized within the boundaries of these newly consolidated states, and uh, technologies that lubricated trade such as transportation, better roads, better uh, bridles for horses, instruments of timekeeping, and other technologies. The result was that uh, zero-sum plunder, where uh, the plunderer's gain was the victim's loss, was increasingly replaced by positive-sum trade, where both parties to a voluntary uh, exchange can benefit. The third major transition uh, can be illustrated by some of the methods that the early states used to impose peace on their kingdoms. Punishments such as breaking on the wheel, where the victim would be tied to a wagon wheel and the uh, executioner would smash his or her bones, uh, her uh, arms and legs with a sledgehammer, at which point the victim would be hoisted up on the wagon wheel and left to die of exposure and shock. Uh, burning at the stake sawing in half from the uh, crotch up, uh, impalement through the rectum, and clawing uh, the flesh with uh, iron hooks. Uh, however, in a remarkably narrow slice of time, centered in the 18th century, uh, torture as a form of uh, punishment was abolished by every major country, uh, including the United States in its famous prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. This was part of a uh, global movement to abolish judicial torture. The 18th century also saw the uh, abolition of other institutionalized forms of violence that we now consider barbaric, such as the frivolous application of the death penalty. England in the 18th century had 222 capital offenses on the book, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and, quote, strong evidence of malice in a child aged 7 to 14 years of age. Uh, this was not just a theoretical possibility, but uh, was carried out with relish. Samuel Johnson, for example, in his diary, uh, speaks about a 7-year-old girl who was hanged for stealing a petticoat. By 1861, the list of capital crimes was down to four, basically a high treason, murder, and some of its variations. In the United States, too, there was an enormous list of capital crimes in the colonial and early uh, independent period. I have a graph showing the percentage of American executions for crimes other than murder, and it meanders from close to 100% in the colonial period down to pretty much 0%. Nowadays, the only crimes against people that are punishable by uh, execution other than murder are a conspiracy to commit murder. The death penalty itself was put on death row starting uh, in the 18th century, and uh, it began a a uh, gradual and then a precipitous wave of abolitions of capital punishment. Nowadays, the United States is the only Western democracy that even has the death penalty, and even then, uh, only in two-thirds of the states. And even then, to say that the United States has the death penalty is a bit of a fiction. If you look at the number of American executions as a proportion of the population, it has been plunging, and so now the graph hugs the floor. Nowadays, about 50 people are executed every year in a country that has uh, close to 17,000 homicides. So even here, it, the, in a, uh, the backwater of death penalty abolitions, the death penalty is a shadow of its former self. Other abolitions during the humanitarian revolution include witch hunts, religious persecution, such as burning heretics at the stake, dueling, blood sports, debtors' prisons, and of course, slavery, where the end of the 18th century saw a, uh, the beginning of a tidal wave of abolitions of uh, slavery. Uh, in the United States, again, a bit behind the curve, not doing it until the 1860s, but uh, today, for the first time in history, no, slavery is not legal anywhere in the world. It used to be that slavery was legal everywhere in the world and indeed uh, endorsed as part of the natural order of things by the ancient Greeks, by the, uh, the Bible, and uh, just about everyone else.
What were the immediate causes of the humanitarian revolution? Well, I've looked at a number of candidates, and the most plausible in terms of something that happened before the humanitarian revolution was advances in printing and literacy. Uh, printing was the only industry that showed an increase in productivity prior to the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, and the uh, cost of printing a book plunged in the uh, 16th, century, 16th and 17th centuries. The result was an exponential increase in the number of books that were published in European countries, and there were more people who could read them. In the 18th century, for the first time, a majority of Englishmen were literate. Well, why should literacy matter? The uh, causes are those that we uh, abbreviate with the term the Enlightenment. For one thing, knowledge replaced superstition and ignorance. Uh, as Voltaire said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Uh, as, you, as your society becomes uh, smart enough to debunk various forms of hogwash, such as that heretics go to hell, Jews poison wells, witches cause crop failures, children are possessed, Africans are brutish, kings rule by divine right, and so on, it's bound to undermine many traditional rationales for violence. Uh, also, literacy can be part of a general current uh, towards cosmopolitanism, also encouraged by technologies such as uh, ships that allow the easy movement of and mixing of peoples. And it is plausible that as people spend more of their waking life reading fiction and history and journalism, they uh, start to inhabit other people's minds, see the world from their point of view therefore developing more empathy and less cruelty. If you reflexively try to imagine what it's like to be some other person, maybe you're a little less likely to enjoy seeing them disemboweled. Uh, the fourth uh, historical transition had to wait uh, another 150 years or so, and it's a uh, uh, development that, borrowing from the political scientist John Gaddis, I call the long peace. And it speaks to the common conception that the 20th century was the most violent in history. Now, interestingly, people who repeat that claim never back it up with any numbers from any century other than the 20th century. And it's highly likely that that claim is, uh, is fallacious. Now, it certainly is true that the Second World War was the deadliest event in human history in terms of the absolute number of people who were killed. On the other hand, the world had a whole lot more people in the 20th century than it had in past centuries, and we record and care about war deaths a lot more in the 20th century than people did in previous centuries. If you try to estimate, uh, admittedly retrospectively, the death tolls from atrocities in past centuries, and you scale them by the size of the world's population at the time, it's not so clear that the 20th century was the worst. I've taken figures from uh, several atrocitologists, as they call themselves, such as uh, Matthew White from his, his forthcoming book, The Great Big Book of Horrible Things, where he lists the 100 worst things that people have ever done to each other that we know of. Uh, I divided them by estimates of the world's population at the time, and what happens is that uh, World War II comes in in ninth place, and World War I doesn't even make the top ten. That other atrocities such as the Mongol invasions, the African slave trade, the uh, annihilation of Native Americans, uh, and basically every time a dynasty fell in China, there could be several uh, tens of millions of people killed. Uh, and in, if you look at the worst atrocities throughout human history plotted over time, they pretty much form a, uh, an even cloud for 2,500 years. If you then uh, zoom in on the last 500 years, where we could do a little bit better, instead of just plotting uh, the atrocities, we can add them up for uh, the, the centuries. The political scientist Jack Levy has done that for a particular category of mass violence, namely great power wars. Wars that embroil the 800-pound guerrillas of the day, the largest states, and the ones that in fact do far more damage when they get into a war than all the little wars combined.
If you plot the proportion of years between 1500 and 2000, in which the great powers of the day fought each other, you see a curve in which for the early uh, centuries, the great powers were pretty much always at war. Uh, there were, are many points in the curve that hit 100% of the years in, in a quarter century. Now the great powers are virtually never at war. The last great power war was the Korean War that ended in 1953. If you plot the duration of wars involving a great power, on at least one side, the duration goes down. We used to have things like the 30 Years War, the 80 Years War, the 100 Years War. In the 20th century, we had the Six Day War. Uh, if you plot the frequency of wars involving a great power, that is how many new wars are started every year, again, you have a curve that works its way uh, downward from 1500 to the present. However, there is one curve that goes in the opposite direction. If you look for most of, of its history, if you plot the uh, deadliness of wars involving a great power, that is not how many wars are started, but how many people are killed once a war does begin, that goes in the other direction. That goes upward. That is, nations got better and better at killing larger and larger numbers of soldiers until 1945, in which that curve does an abrupt U-turn. And since 1945, wars for the first time in history have become both less numerous and less deadly per nation year of war. If you then combine these two figures, you multiply the number of wars uh, by the deadliness of each war, you get a zigzaggy curve, but the uh, crucial point is that the last point on that curve, representing the last uh, 25 years, in fact, the last two points, the last 50 years, are hitting all-time lows over the last uh, 500 years. This is the phenomenon called the long peace, uh, namely that in the last two-thirds of a century, since 1945, there's been a historically unprecedented decline in interstate war, wars between countries. To be exact, and here are some statistics that are very easy to convey, they don't need a graph because they all uh, consist of the number zero. There were no wars between the Soviet Union and the United States, uh, which may sound uh, unexceptionable today, but Every expert predicted that World War III was inevitable. Many people in the, in the room grew up with the experts assuring us that uh, it was only a matter of time before the US and USSR fought, duked it out. Uh, no nuclear weapons have been used since Nagasaki in wartime, again, confounding every expert prediction. There, as I've mentioned, there have been no wars between great powers since 1953, probably the longest span of time without a great power war since the Roman Empire. There have been no wars between Western European countries. Again, your first reaction might be to say, well, ho-hum, of course there haven't. Uh, no one expects, say, you know, France and Germany to go to war. Uh, what a concept. Uh, or <laughs> Sweden and Russia. Uh, but, of course, any student of European history uh, knows that this was the rule, not the exception, until the precipitous decline of interstate war after 1945. There have been no wars between developed countries, that is, the 45 or so countries with the highest GDP per capita. Now, what about the rest of the world? Uh, well, there is a, a fifth major decline of violence that I call the new peace, uh, that refers to the rest of the, of the world. So what happens in, what's happened if we set aside the great powers, the Western European countries, the rich countries, what was the rest of the world doing? Well, there was a worldwide decline in the number of interstate wars where one country declares war against another. Uh, however, there has been a huge increase in civil wars. Uh, it mainly exploding starting in the 1960s when newly independent states with inept governments were challenged by insurgent movements and both sides were armed and financed and egged on by the Cold War superpowers. However, since 1991, even the number of civil wars has declined with the end of the Cold War. And uh, one now has to ask if the number of interstate wars went down, the number of civil wars went up, which ones kill more people? 
And the answer is very clear. Interstate wars kill far more people, or at least they have uh, since the late 1940s. There's nothing like a pair of uh, great powers chucking artillery shells at each other, bombing each other's cities, sending massive number of tanks to do battle, uh, to rack up high body counts in a hurry. In comparison, the, uh, some teenagers armed with AK-47s can surely make life miserable in the local areas in which they work, but they simply don't do the same n uh, amount of uh, nationwide damage. And again, and again, I have a graph showing the deadliness of interstate and civil wars over the last 55 years. The number of deaths in interstate war per year of war has plummeted. Uh, for civil wars, it just a, a, a a slight in increase followed by a decrease. If you then add up the deaths from all sorts of war, that is interstate and civil uh, wars, what you find is a bumpy decline with peaks for uh, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Iran-Iraq War. But in the last 10 years, the figures hug the floor. They're basically a narrow little stripe. Uh, and just to, since you can't see the picture, I'll describe it in uh, numbers. In the, uh, during the worst years of World War II, the death rate from war was about 300 per 100,000 per year. During the late 1940s and early 1950s, it had fallen to about uh, 22 per 100,000 per year. In the last, this past decade, it has been at uh, one-third of a uh, uh, death per 100,000 people per year, using a constant yardstick of battle deaths. And this is the phenomenon I've been calling the new peace. So it would be a bit of an exaggeration, uh, but not too much of an exaggeration, to say that the dream of the 1960s folk singers is uh, almost coming true. That is, the world is almost putting an end to war. What are the immediate causes of the long peace and the new peace? Well, uh, one influential hypothesis came from Immanuel Kant in 1795 uh, in his essay, Perpetual Peace, in which he proposed that democracy, interstate trade, and an international community all would drive down the likelihood of war. Recently, a pair of political scientists, Bruce Russett and John O'Neill, have tested Kant's hypothesis by measuring these factors and showing, first of all, that all of them have increased in the second half of the 20th century, and all of them are statistical predictors of peace. The number of democracies exceeded the number of uh, autocracies around 1990 and, uh, and uh, has shown an increase. The amount of international trade skyrocketed after the end of the Second World War. The membership in intergovernmental organizations has steadily increased throughout the 20th century. And especially since 1990, there has been a huge increase in the number of uh, international peacekeepers, that is, soldiers with blue helmets from uh, and other neutral parties who get in the way between opposing forces. They don't always prevent a reigniting of uh, hostilities into war, but they do far more often than when there are no peacekeepers. Finally, the sixth historical decline of violence I call the rights revolutions, which refers to the targeting of violence at smaller scales against vulnerable minorities, such as uh, racial minorities, women, children, homosexuals, and animals. During the post-war period, the civil war, put, the, sorry, the civil rights movement put an end to lynchings, which used to take place at a rate of, of about 150 per year. Uh, the, the, uh, that went down by the 1950s to zero per year. Hate crime murders of blacks uh, have been in the single digits uh, since they were first recorded and have since then plunged to uh, about one per year. Non-lethal hate crimes against blacks, such as intimidation and assault, have declined since they were first measured. Uh, the kinds of racist attitudes that in the past would license outbursts of violence, uh, such as genocides and pogroms, have been in steady decline. For example, in the United States, if you ask white people, uh, would you move if a black family moved in next door? Do you believe that black and white students should go to separate schools? Do you think that the uh, income gap between blacks and whites is due to lower ability or to lower motivation? 
All of those racist attitudes have been in steady decline. Many of them have fallen so low that they're in the realm of crank opinion, and the pollsters have dropped them from their surveys. The women's rights movements have seen an 80% decline in rape since the early 70s when the statistics were first kept. A, uh, uh, also a precipitous decline in domestic violence. A uh, strong decline in the most extreme forms of domestic violence, namely uxoricide and muridicide, that is the killing of wives and husbands. Although here I must add that the decline has been far steeper for wives killing husbands than husbands killing wives. The uh, women's movement has been very, very good for men. Uh, the children's rights movement has seen a steady decline in the number of American states that have corporal punishment or paddling a decline in every Western country in the degree of approval of spanking, a decline in physical abuse and sexual abuse of children since statistics were first kept, and a decline in school violence such as uh, fighting and non-fatal crimes. The gay rights movement has seen a, an increase in the number of states that have decriminalized homosexuality, both states worldwide and American states a decline in anti-gay attitudes, such as whether homosexuality is morally wrong, should be made illegal, or whether gay people should be denied equal opportunity, and a decline in at least one category of anti-gay hate crimes. The animal rights movement has seen a decline in hunting, a rise in vegetarianism, and a decline in the percentage of motion pictures in which animals were harmed. <laughs> Well, all of this raises a question. Why have all of these graphs meandered downward uh, over the course of history? Why have there been so many different declines of violence at different scales of magnitude and time? Well, one possibility is that human nature has changed and that somehow people have lost their inclinations toward violence. I consider this an unlikely explanation. Uh, for one thing, uh, toddlers continue to hit, kick, and bite. Uh, little boys continue to play fight. Uh, Grown-up boys and uh, many girls enjoy various forms of vicarious violence, such as murder mysteries, Greek tragedies, Shakespearean dramas, video games, uh, ice hockey, and, uh, and movies starring a certain ex-governor of California. And a number of social psychologists have assessed the um, prevalence of homicidal fantasies. They've asked people the question, have you ever fantasized about killing someone you don't like? Well, it turns out that about 15% of women and about a third of men frequently fantasize about <laughs> killing people they don't like. Uh, more than 60% of women and three quarters of men at least occasionally fantasize about killing people they don't like. And the rest of them are lying. <laughs> A more likely possibility is that human nature is extraordinarily complex and it comprises both inclinations toward violence and inclinations that counteract them, what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature, from which I took the title of my own book. And that historical circumstances have increasingly favored <coughs> our peaceable inclinations, our better angels. Well, what are these, uh, these forces in conflict? Uh, fighting it out inside the skull. I think that violence is not a single psychological category. We have a number of psychologically and even neurobiologically very distinct motives that can result in violence. There's sheer exploitation, the use of violence as a means to an end when some living thing is an obstacle in the path of something that you want, which we see played out in uh, violence such as rape, plunder, conquest, and the elimination of rivals. Very different from that is the quest for dominance, the drive uh, for individuals to climb the pecking order and be alpha male, and the analogous drive among groups for ethnic, racial, national, or religious supremacy. The uh, very large category of revenge and moralistic violence, which results in vendettas, rough justice, and cruel punishments. Uh, and perhaps the biggest category are consist of violence pursued in um, quest of an ideology. 
such as militant religions, nationalism, fascism, Nazism, and communism, which can license vast outlays of violence because of a pernicious utopian cost-benefit analysis. If your ideology holds out the prospect of a future world that is infinitely good forever, well, uh, what are you entitled to do in order to attain that world? Well, you can commit pretty much as much violence as you want, and you're still going to be making the world a better place by this cost-benefit analysis. Also, imagine that you are, have been vouchsafed with the uh, one uh, true faith according to which there is a utopia to which uh, you can strive. And there are some people who hear about this uh, utopia, but they just stubbornly reject it. Well, how evil are they? Well, you do the math, uh, arbitrarily evil. And that is why the tales of the distribution of, uh, of uh, massive violence tend to be uh, pushed outward by utopian ideologies. Well, what do we have on the other side to counteract these motives for violence? What are our better angels? There's self-control, the ability to anticipate the consequences of our behavior and to inhibit violent impulses. There's empathy, <coughs> the uh, ability to feel others' pain. There's the moral sense, which is a family of intuitions, some of which, like tribalism, authoritarianism, and puritanism, can actually increase <laughs> violence. But at least one flavor of the moral sense, the uh, drive for fairness, can counteract violence. And then there's reason, the cognitive faculties that allow us to engage in objective, detached analysis. Well, if we have, then, these inclinations toward violence on the one hand, these inhibitions against violence on the other, what has tipped the balance over the course of history? What has brought out our better angels? The first possibility was proposed by Hobbes in his book called The Leviathan. A uh, Leviathan referring to a state and judicial system with a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence can eliminate the incentives for exploitative attack by uh, punishing it, can re thereby reduce the need for deterrence and vengeance, can circumvent the self-serving biases by which both sides to a dispute always believe that they are on the side of the angels and that the other side is wicked or stupid or stubborn or all three. Uh, people we know from social psychology research exaggerate their adversaries' malevolence and exaggerate their own innocence. This can stoke cycles of revenge unless you have a disinterested third party deciding who's to blame and meeting out the penalties. Some historical evidence that the Leviathan has been a pacifying force consists of the first two transitions that I discussed this evening, the pacifying and civilizing effects of states, and the fact that we can watch these movies in reverse in zones of anarchy where, indeed, violence can re-erupt, such as the American Wild West, where the cliché of the cowboy movies was that the nearest sheriff is 90 miles away, in failed states, in collapsed empires, and in mafias and street gangs who deal in contraband and therefore cannot settle their disputes by calling in the state. They can't file a lawsuit. They can't dial 911 because of the nature of the work that they do, and so they have to enforce their interests with their own rough justice, resulting in uh, the Corleones, the Sopranos, and uh, those uh, kinds of vendettas. Uh, other evidence at the international scale includes the effectiveness of international peacekeepers. The second historical force that draws out our better angels, I suggest, is uh, gentle commerce. The idea that uh, plunder is a zero-sum game, but tra trade is a positive-sum game in which everybody can win. Over the course of history, as technology improves and allows the trade of goods and ideas over longer distances among larger groups of people and at lower cost, more and more of the rest of humanity becomes more valuable alive than dead. Uh, a concrete example might be that there isn't a whole lot of affection between the United States and China these days, but it's not terribly likely that they'll go to war. Uh, among other things, they make too much of our stuff, and we owe them too much money. <laughs>
Some historical evidence for the theory of gentle commerce uh, consists of historical, uh, sorry, statistical analyses showing that countries with open economies and greater amounts of international trade get embroiled in fewer wars, host fewer civil wars, and host fewer genocides. The third historical uh, force has been called the expanding circle. This is a concept that was named by Peter Singer, but first endorsed uh, by Charles Darwin more than a century before. The idea is that evolution bequeathed us with a sense of empathy. Unfortunately, by default, we apply it only to a narrow circle of friends and family. But over the course of history, you can see the circle of empathy expanding to embrace not just the family, but the village, then the clan, then the tribe, then the nation, then it's extended to other races, to both sexes, to children, and eventually to other sentient beings, other species. This just begs the question of what expanded the circle. And as I hinted earlier, technologies that increase cosmopolitanism may have that effect the uh, growing appreciation of history, of literature, of media, of journalism, growing opportunities for travel. Uh, and we know from the social psychology laboratory that if you get a person to adopt the perspective of some other real or fictitious person, they are more sympathetic to that person and they're more sympathetic to the category of people that that individual represents. Historical evidence includes the fact that in the 17th and 18th century, there was a, uh, an expansion of literacy and travel, the so-called Republic of Letters, which preceded the humanitarian revolution. It may not be a coincidence that the second half of the 20th century, which had the long peace and the rights revolutions, was also the era of the electronic global village. And it's often been speculated that the rise of internet and social media has uh, assisted the color revolutions and the Arab Spring. The final historical force I call the escalator of reason. Uh, the possibility that the growth of literacy, education, and public discourse has encouraged people to think more abstractly and more universally. They get into the habit of rising above their parochial vantage point, which makes it harder to privilege your own interests over the interests of others. It encourages you to replace a morality based on tribalism, authority, and puritanism with a morality based on fairness and universal rules. It encourages people to recognize the futility of cycles of violence and increasingly to see violence as a problem to be solved rather than as a contest to be won. What is the evidence? Well, one intriguing piece of evidence is that abstract reasoning abilities, as measured by IQ tests, believe it or not, increased over the course of the 20th century. Throughout the 20th century and all over the world, IQ increased by about three points a decade, the so-called Flynn effect. Uh, how could this have affected violence? Well, other studies have shown that people and societies with higher levels of education and of measured intelligence, holding all else equal, commit fewer violent crimes on average, cooperate more in experimental games, uh, have more classically liberal attitudes such as opposition to uh, racism and sexism, and are more receptive to democracy. Well, why do, why have I ended up with this list of four very different, seemingly very different forces? Why are they all pushing in the same direction toward less violence? The closest I think we can come to an overarching theory is that violence is what game theorists call a social dilemma. That is, it's always tempting to an aggressor to engage in predatory or exploitative violence, but on the other hand, it's quite ruinous to the victim. In the long run, all parties are better off if violence is avoided. And our dilemma as humans, our, uh, our pickle, is how to get the other guy to re refrain from violence at the same time as you do. If you are the only one to beat your swords into plowshares, then you are ba a sitting duck for invasion by the bad guys. Everyone's got to decide to beat their swords into plowshares at the same time. One can see these forces as uh, cases in which human experience and human ingenuity gradually solves this problem, just like 
other scourges of nature, like pestilence and hunger that we've dealt with, and that all of these forces have increased the material, emotional, and cognitive incentives of all parties to avoid violence simultaneously. Well, regardless of the correct explanation for the decline of violence, uh, I think its implications for understanding the human condition are profound. For one thing, they call for a reorientation of efforts toward violence reduction from a moralistic mindset to an empirical mindset. Instead of asking, why is there war, we might be better off asking, why is there peace? Instead of, what are we doing wrong, we might ask, what have we been doing right? Because we have been doing something right, and it sure would be good to find out exactly what it is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steven Pinker. This was a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, already, uh, people are lining up for the questions. Um, I want, I'm going to ask again. I know I'm never successful, but I'm still going to keep trying. Uh, I'd like you to keep your questions really brief, and so everyone gets a chance. And um, and. Stephen, I'd like you to keep your answers brief. <laughs> so it works, it works both ways. And if you're comfortable, please say your name. I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. Um, my question is Germany. Um, it was the most cosmopolitan, the most highly educated uh, society, arguably, in, in Europe. And they did the most horrible crime. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's a little misleading to say it, because there were sectors of Germany that indeed were cosmopolitan educated. There were also sectors of Germany that were um, more tribal in their mindset, deeply anti-Semitic. Uh, there was a, <coughs> and even among the German elite, there was a widespread rejection of the Enlightenment, which was dismissed as that, that French business, uh, and a, 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 rather than a, an acceptance of uh, the idea of universal rights and an emphasis on, on uh, the flourishing of individuals, there was a, a rather primitive embrace of uh, blood and soul, uh, soil, of uh, tribalism. Now, granted, you're certainly right, there was this uh, flourishing of cosmopolitan sentiments among some sectors of the German population. The problem was they were all murdered. Uh, so the, the general answer is that it was, um, that when it comes to an entire society, uh, it's important to see how dynamics can lead uh, to competition among the various sectors. And it's only if you have a robust democracy in which the cosmopolitan uh, currents, the cosmopolitan people are not murdered, that it can affect the course of the society as a whole. First a comment and then a question. I think a fantasy that Carla would appreciate was that Boonwell, the great Spanish filmmaker and perhaps the cleverest of all, uh, as he was dying, said in his autobiography, if only every 10 years I could get up out of the grave and get a newspaper and keep in touch with what's going on in the world. That's uh, your, your presentation is, is, in terms of overt violence, is extraordinarily impressive. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's a containment uh, in one sense in the proliferation of, of, of uh, violent games starting with kids as young as two and two and three and the tremendous compulsive preoccupation with violence in, um, in, in, in all the media, in, in, in football and so forth. And I, I would call it a kind of externalization, not a sublimation. Uh, but, um, but contained. And uh, part of it, I think, is, uh, well, Freud, Freud spoke of the, the per pervasity of violence um, and, and, and his aggressive drive, and, and that um, you can kind of identify with, with people who are, who are suffering and say, thank God it isn't me. And then, but even more important, murder mysteries. Mm -hmm. Somebody, I, I can fantasize that I've done this murder, but somebody else is going to be discovered, and, my, and I can go conscience free. Yes, I, <laughs> I, agree. I, uh, I agree that yeah. that a pleasure pleasure taken in violent entertainment yeah. is a great constant of yeah. the, the human experience. Uh, I don't 
believe that uh, violent entertainment causes violence. Uh, the uh, huge expansion of violent video games has been accompanied by the great American crime decline since right. the early 1990s. I don't, I, I also not uh, convinced by a kind of hydraulic model that if you get your violent urges out through violent entertainment, you're less likely to commit it in real life. Uh, I think that it's a, a guilty pleasure that people of all eras have had. If you look at Titus Andronicus, uh, if you look at uh, the Penny Dreadfuls, if you look at the Old Testament, if you look at the Lives of the Saints, there's a lot of really gruesome stuff in there. Uh, people enjoy it for interesting reasons, I think including the ones that you mentioned, but it's a tenuous connection to real life violence. Uh, I, I would think that but very few people uh, uh, watch torture and execution in terms of the total population, and now it's a, a large part of the population. So it's one. Well, people that. came out and brought up the whole family to watch really uh, uh, stomach-turning uh, public executions, burnings and breakings and strangulations and disembowelment. So in the, in the past, it was possible for an entire population to be overcome by a kind of collective sadism. One last comment. I noticed there was laughter in Twitter when we talked about disembowelment and mummies with, uh, with cords around their neck. Folks, we have a long line, and I would, like, I would like everyone to get their chance. Yes. Good evening and Happy New Year to those to whom it is applicable. Shana if you, wanted, you uh, said if anyone wanted to give names, we could. I'll give a nickname and um, leave it to the imagination to figure out it's polymath. Anyways, question is this, and by the way, I was very much impressed by your presentation. I've always wanted to meet you. No bizarre fantasies there, but just wanted to <laughs> um, Trust me, I'm, I'm no, no murder involved, but believe me, I'm, I'm very passive. But question is this. Do you think some people are actually biological, have a tendency to really almost be inherently evil? I've sometimes looked at clowns in the dark, and they I look like as though maybe there's a fear of clowns. I still have that they could, these toy clowns could arouse evil. Little children and I'm holding like scissors behind their back and saying, you know, three-year-olds, you know, look like little charming, pretty little girls. You want to play? You want to play? And if you get too close, watch out. That, that knife is going to, that scissors are going to be a, a nice dagger in your guts. And no matter how you raise them, even if they're adopted by the most nicest, kindest people, most intellectually brilliant, there's something about them that they like to see others suffer. Yeah. There is, the, the answer is that there is a substantial heritable component to antisocial tendencies, and at the extreme end, violent antisocial tendencies. It's not uh, obviously completely heritable, but within a population, the troublemakers, the um, mo more callous, more impulsive people, uh, they get that way in part before genetic reasons because thanks to the, re the real life research that carries out the thought experiment you mentioned, namely compare uh, adoptive children to their biological and parents and their adoptive parents, shows that there is some statistical tendency. The most extreme are psychopaths, uh, a few percentage points of the population, that seem to be without the ability to uh, develop a conscience that counts the interests of others. So it's, uh, among individuals, there does seem to be some heritability, yes. You never know. The average person I think know. we need to move yes. on. I think it's Thank only you. fair that everyone get a chance. Thank you. Hi, my name, my name is Noah Brayali. And my, my question is about um, um, the backroom boys. It's a, f a phrase that was uh, used to refer to uh, the chemists and chemical engineers at DuPont who developed uh, um, the napalm that was you know, used to great effect in, um, uh, in, in, in the war against Indochina. The United States was involved with the Vietnam War. And uh, so um, in reviewing the, the record of um, uh, the, the backroom boys, uh, Professor Noam Chomsky, a friend of yours, colleague of yours, I'm sure you know who he is, uh, uh, remarks that there's a, uh, an objectivity and a distance from the effects of their actions that these backroom boys had in their very technological occupations. And he traces it to uh, the Thirty Years' War. 
and mentions that this uh, institutionalized violence by objective and rational and reasonable people uh, through largely technological means has its roots in those uh, prolonged genocidal conflicts that you mentioned have abated in uh, severity. So at that time, uh, maybe 30 percent of what's now uh, Czech, Czech Republic had just perished through the effects of that war. And as you rightly mentioned, the percentages of genocidal conflict uh, uh, killed by these kind of wars have declined precipitously. Uh, but the institutions seem to remain with us, in particular this dispassionate, reasonable and objective countenancing of extreme violence, particularly technological <laughs> in form, like these backroom boys at DuPont in the 1950s, developing napalm and other uh, you know, very effective killing agents. Yes. Well, the, <coughs> what I've really been concerned with is when these agents have been deployed. And it's interesting that as, contrary to what I often hear, namely as we develop high-tech push-button forms of warfare, won't that uh, uh, circumvent the inhibitions that we have against hands-on, bloody, gory violence, and therefore would, you, would that lead you to expect violence to go way up? And I don't think that that's consistent with the process of history. You mentioned the Thirty Years' War with the, those uh, horrific rates of, of, uh, of violent death, and those were carried out by you know, pikemen and uh, with edged weapons and uh, uh, bayonets and so on. Uh, I think people can very easily overcome their resistance to hands-on violence, and in fact it's often the most high-tech forms of uh, violence that are deployed uh, most gingerly, nuclear weapons being an example which have uh, not been used since Nagasaki. Uh, so I think the correlation is much less than people think simply because it is so easy to commit hands-on violence. On, on his, on the histor you're, you're talking about the historical record, on, the, yeah. uh, on this historical link between this technology of violence and that particular, um, you know, pattern of, uh, in particular in Europe, in Northern Europe, this pattern of uh, you know, technologically very rich and uh, devoted to culture of violence. You know, you've reviewed this history of violence. How, uh, how, how clear is that connection? Yeah. The, uh, technology, the highest technology of any culture is typically applied to weapons of war. So the Mongolian um, hordes on horseback had amazingly well-engineered composite bows that could do vast amounts of damage very quickly. So that's something that people seems to bring out people's ingenuity. I am uh, Paul Steinberg, a psychiatrist here in town, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering if you could just comment on this, these thoughts that uh, you may be dismissing uh, uh, the change in human nature a little too uh, qu quickly in the sense that uh, genes are always in a dance with uh, the environment. And I know you cite, uh, I haven't read your book, but I, s I know you cite Greg Clark and his research is remarkable in looking at what happened starting in the 13th century with the royals uh, uh, just being much more fertile than the lower classes. And, uh, and then the bourgeoisie, yes. And the bourge made of bourgeoisie created the Enlightenment, but it took 500, 600 years for the Industrial Revolution to happen. So we had more people in England who had what uh, Ned Hallowell calls uh, attention surplus disorder and fewer people with attention deficit disorder, yeah. less impulsivity, uh, greater concentration, greater self-control. And when a society moves in that direction, you reach a critical mass that may actually change uh, uh, the way uh, it fuels, it, it certainly fuels uh, uh, just a change in the, uh, in the culture. Yes, uh, I, and, and I discuss that possibility at length in the book. I end up not embracing it, though not rejecting it, mainly because of lack of, for one thing, lack of evidence. It, it, it makes the prediction, for example, that Englishmen, uh, regardless of uh, their culture should be genetically less prone to impulsivity and violence than uh, people uh, from other cultures and races. This isn't a possibility that I'm eager to test anytime soon or anyone else. Uh, but moreover, it may be unnecessary. My, the, the, uh, it's very early in the investigation of recent biological evolution. But given that some of the developments that I discuss occurred far too rapidly to be attributable to genetic evolution, such as the plunging of the crime rate since 1992 or the rights revolutions. So something must have happened that was not genetic that could account for that plummeting. So on grounds of parsimony, I figure uh, we don't have any need for the hypothesis that there's also been a genetic change while not ruling it out. I'm a terrible public speaker, but a huge fan, so I'll try to keep it together and ask you a question here. Um, I'm curious about people's relationship in a representative democracy with civilian law enforcement, and it's really interesting to hear about 
you know, declining rates of violence, but at the same time, things like paramilitary police forcing and SWAT teams have like gone way beyond their original intention for like hostage situations. And even famously last year, someone, you know, they're breaking into people's homes over, you know, college loans, et cetera. So, so if, if rates of violence are really declining amongst the people, why are the, law, the civilian law enforcement seem to be flexing their muscles in a way that doesn't correlate with the decline in violence? Mm -hmm. Well, it's, um, we have to look at figures over time of government violence perpetrated against its own civilians. And I suspect that, that there hasn't been much at all of an increase compared to earlier decades and centuries. Uh, in bringing in the Leviathan, to keep people from each other's throats, you then introduce the second problem of keeping the Leviathan from people's throats. That first transition was a, a tough bargain because it did lower the rate of violence, but then it gave you this, these uh, bloodthirsty despots to deal with. The democratic revolution, and indeed the continuing uh, battle for democracy and civil liberties is an attempt to find that sweet spot where the government is powerful enough to deter predation by one citizen over another, but not so powerful that it becomes a menace to its own citizens. And that's something that we're, I, I suspect, always going to muddle through. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to make sure that everyone in line gets to ask their question, and th that will be our limit tonight. So. Hi, my name is Gregory Walsh. Um, I want to say I've been really looking forward to reading this book ever since seeing a speech you gave three or four years ago at the, the TED conference yes. on this same topic. Um, I was, however, wondering if you could uh, comment on uh, some allegations made in a book I recently read called, um, I've got a blank on the name, uh, Sex at Dawn, the Prehistoric, Evolu uh, Prehistoric Origins of Modern Sexuality, in which those authors alleged that some of the data you present about uh, rates of violence among hunter-gatherer cultures, which you called, I think, non-state peoples tonight, is erroneous. They, they allege, for example, that uh, the data at the time it was collected, these people had had contact with modern society for many decades, that um, they're not, in fact, nomadic, they're settled peoples. Um, I've just been curious ever since reading that to hear your response to some of those allegations. Yeah, I'm not familiar with those allegations, but the, um, the data that I present are, um, uh, many of them are from people who definitely had no contact with uh, any Europeans, such as samples of skeletons from pre-Columbian Native Americans. Uh, many of them are also from uh, hunter-gatherer and hunter-horde culturalist people who also had no contact. So I don't know, you know, I can't respond to these allegations not knowing what they are, but certainly the sources that I've consulted make it very clear when there has or has not been uh, contact. And they span a, a range. There are some societies that don't have measured rates of, uh, of uh, homicide or deaths in war, but uh, on average the rates are way up there and they're from many, many societies of different kinds. What they have in common is not living under uh, government, and that seems to uh, uniformly give, or no, I shouldn't say uniformly because there are some at the tail of the distribution, but on average give rise to high rates of violence. And uh, from what I can tell from the, both the ethnographic and archaeological literature, that's a, a, a solid conclusion. Uh, and I cite many surveys uh, that, that uh, have the numbers that, uh, that back up that claim. Thank you. Yes, I am uh, Rich Blaustein. Thanks for your stimulating presentation. I guess uh, when you're listing, uh, listing uh, factors uh, showing decline in violence in our society, everything from, you know, paddling to death penalty to rape, uh, I guess one exception that kind of stood out in my mind would be incarceration, mm -hmm. uh, very high level of incarceration. Of course, there are violent people that deserve to be, but there's also nonviolent crimes. There are huge sentences, uh, people thrown into a situation where that prison life is not getting less violent. I was wondering how you factor into that at the yeah. larger picture. Well, in historical terms, uh, modern American prisons, as horrible as they are, are much less violent than prisons uh, several hundred years ago, mm -hmm. when you could have, say, prisoners 
uh, shackled to the floor or wearing iron spiked collars and their family would have to pay for easement of irons for the spiked collar to be taken off when there was uh, extremely high rates of death from disease and starvation in the prisons. This is not to defend the current American prisons by any means, but historically uh, it would be inaccurate to take the current American imprisonment binge as evidence that nothing has uh, improved. Now, the American imprisonment bulge of the last uh, 20 years partly was a way of reducing the, uh, counteracting the enormous increase in street violence uh, and violent crimes of all types that had uh, overtaken the United States from the 60s through the 1980s. The homicide rate more than doubled in those decades, the rate of rape, the rate of assault. And so as a rather clumsy countermeasure, there was an increase in incarceration, which in part was responsible for the fact that the uh, violent crime rates have plunged back to earth since the 1990s. Not entirely because uh, there were a, a number of other causes of the violence decline, but most statisticians of crime attribute at least part of the crime decline to the increase in, in imprisonment. Now, in the United States, as with many uh, other uh, of the trends that I've been mentioning, it's a little misleading. It's the country we all know best, and we tend to think of it as representative of, of Western democracies, but it's really, really an outlier. And a lot of the trends that I've mentioned have, uh, are true for every Western democracy but the United States, which is kind of pulling up the rear. And uh, it's true of homicide, it's true of capital punishment, it's true of willingness to engage in wars, uh, and it's true of imprisonment, where we throw a disproportionately large proportion of our population uh, in, in prison compared to other Western democracies. But certainly on the century scale, there's just no comparison between today's prisons and, and uh, those of the 19th and 18th centuries. Hi, my name is Megan, and I was wondering if you could share with us a bit about the methods you use to arrive to these to these numbers that you talked about tonight. Um, did you do kind of independent testing with statistics, like kind of look at this type of cause, mm -hmm. like did this factor cause X, you know, change these things? So could you share with us kind of the source of your numbers and how you arrived at them? Well, it depends on the numbers because for different periods of history and different kinds of violence, the numbers have different sources. So for the uh, state non-state contrast. It came from ethnographies of, of uh, extant tribal peoples and from forensic archaeology. For the history of homicide in Europe, it came from historical criminology, uh, such as the uh, uh, unearthing coroner's records for every year in a particular parish or town in Europe going back to the Middle Ages. In the case of war, it depends on the period. For since 1946, there have been meticulous statistics kept on deaths in armed conflict by a couple of Scandinavian organizations. Before uh, 1946, there was the Correlates of War Project, which looked at death rates from the largest wars from 1816 to the present. Prior to 1816, it becomes, uh, as you can imagine, the farther back you go, the fuzzier the statistics get. But there is a line of historians, quantitative historians, that have tried to uh, triangulate on estimates of the death tolls from various wars to come up with best guessed estimates. Uh, for homicide, more recently, the FBI keeps reasonably good statistics, at least they have since the 1930s. For crimes other than homicide, like uh, rape and assault, uh, the best data are victimization surveys, which aren't contaminated by people's willingness to report a crime to the police. For still others, like uh, child abuse and domestic violence, uh, there are victimization surveys or other social science methodologies. So it all depends on the kind of violence. Now, did you take a new approach with analyzing the results from these? Or in general, what I did was I took the data sets in their entirety from other researchers and never second-guessed the criteria, either the start date, the stop, the stop date, what gets included, what gets uh, excluded, because I didn't want to do any cherry picking to try to favor this hypothesis. So the uh, data sets that I use vary in their quality for sure, but none of them were selected in order to show a decline or manipulated in order to show a decline. I just dumped all the data uh, in there, even when I knew that some of the uh, inclusions were, were dodgy for various reasons, but I didn't give myself the freedom of cherry picking them.
Hi. Um, I was just wondering, um, <clears throat> Putnam finds that social capital has been declining in the United States, mm -hmm. um, interconnection, community. And I would have thought that that would lead to maybe more violence, more crime, but it seems like um, we've had a decline in crime despite, you know, those kinds of uh, um, maybe troubling figures. Now, I was wondering if you get any, given any thought to that and had any ideas why, um, you know, Putnam's results might be going in a different direction from uh, your results on crime in this country? Yeah, it's a good question because there are other data sets that would seem to suggest that uh, the rate of violent crime depends on the degree of social interconnectedness and trust in institutions. That of the, the I, when I refer to the civilizing process, that was a decline from about 100 per 100,000 per year to about 10 per 100,000 per year. And that occurs everywhere that government uh, extends its uh, tentacles. But then the further decline that we see in uh, Europe and in parts of the United States from about 10 down to the single digits, the low single digits, seems to depend not on the presence of government, but on some more nebulous process of accepting uh, the legitimacy of the social order that indeed, as you suggest, you'd expect to correlate with the health of, of uh, communal institutions, but as you also point out, don't. Uh, the, the, the embarrassing, dirty little fact is that uh, no statistical criminologist has been successful in accounting for either the increase in crime rate in the 1960s through the 1980s, nor the plunging from the 1990s to the present. Everyone has been doing catch up, all the numbers you plug into the usual models, you throw them in, you turn the crank, you run through the statistical models, and they don't predict why the curves go up and down. So uh, that's, that's the, the embarrassing secret. I do my best in the book to talk about changes in uh, cultural attitudes that could filter down to law enforcement and push these uh, up or down, but we're all basically telling stories post hoc. Thank you. Last question. Uh, my name's Rich Potter. Um, thank you. Uh, I can't wait to read this book. It's a fascinating uh, subject. I'm uh, interested in why is the uh, perception that we live in such a dangerous and violent era, why is that so pervasive? Yeah. It's, it's just amazing how, how uh, discordant that is. Yeah, it, you know, it, is it is indeed a, 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 um, uh, an intriguing question. I think one reason is um, the, what, the, what the media report and what they're getting better at better at reporting. Not only is there the programming policy, if it bleeds, it leads. Uh, media programmers know that just like people, just as people enjoy violent entertainment, they enjoy violent news, and so that gets n promoted number one. We're better at better at finding violence now. Anyone on the planet with a cell phone can beam video footage of violence all over the world. Uh, we and uh, cognitive psychologists know that the human mind estimates risk and likelihood by the ease with which we can recall examples. If you can think of an example, you think it it's must, must be dangerous. We're not as good at calculating denominators. Uh, and the media, of course, don't report denominators. If you've got millions of people dying of Alzheimer's and cancer and heart attacks, if, you know, if Vladimir in Lithuania keels over from a heart attack, uh, there isn't a camera crew filming it. But if Vladimir gets shot by a deranged you know, postal worker, then it'll be on the evening news. And the, the final uh, reason is that we care more about violence now. So a lot of things that just didn't even count as violence, now we consider to be heinous crimes. The most blatant example is genocide, which uh, before the 20th century, no one seemed to think there was anything particularly wrong with genocide. It's all over the Old Testament. That doesn't seem to be a problem for anyone. Uh, there were many. Uh, colonial ministers and politicians who thanked God for wiping out the Indians. Uh, there's a change in sensibility that has gone further and further down the scale to isolate behaviors that before were okay. My favorite example being the recent targeting of bullying. Uh, no less than the President of the United States gave a policy address on what we're going to do about bullying in the playground. Now, 25 years ago, this would have been like a, an episode of The Simpsons. It would have been <laughs> absurd. Uh, boys will be boys. It's part of childhood. How are kids going to be you know, grow up tough if uh, you're going to turn them into sissies? But now we think of life from the point of view of the bullied child. There are many, many 
uh, accounts of the suffering of victims of bullying, and now there's a new category of violence that wasn't even counted as violence before. For more on Steven Pinker and his work, visit stephenpinker.com.